It's time to talk about solutions. It's time to share the vision. It's time to dig deep and work together to create what we want. I am your host, Crystal Storm, and in this podcast, I interview Jay Wall Jasper, award-winning writer, speaker, and author. We talk about what it takes to build lively communities, steps communities can take to provide space for everyone, and why that's so important in today's unfortunately divisive climate. This is the Woo Woo Hour. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the Woo Hour podcast. Happy April. Hope everybody's ready for spring. I know I am. Warm weather is what's up. We're going to do some very, very quick announcements, and then per usual, I'm going to let you guys just jump right into the interview I did with Jay Wall Jasper. I found Jay over on Yes Magazine. You guys know that I love Yes Magazine. It is a great magazine. If you are not reading it, you're just silly. You're just silly. Go to yesmagazine.org. Check it out. They have wonderful, empowering stories on peace and justice, the planet, the new economy, uh, people power, happiness really 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 great site really 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 good journalism please 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 go and check it out over in the not so serious uh twitch sphere we are currently raising funds for depaul international they are an organization that deals with homelessness not just in the uk but worldwide we will be doing that until march 7th um so i will there will be my twitch information down in the show notes so if you guys want to check that out and if you are in a mood to give to this great organization and contribute to our fundraising efforts that would be amazing we have raised eighteen hundred dollars so far at the time of this podcast and i'm recording that at 2 40 on monday april 2nd and we are doing this like i said until april 7th so we're hoping to raise a lot more for this great organization so please go and check them out you can swing into the twitch stream and drop a donation um, that would be lovely and if you can't do that just uh, share the information across your social media networks let everybody else know what's going on and that would be completely completely awesome the next announcement I want to give to you guys is that Women in Hoodies, my other radio show that I do with my co-host every Sunday, has moved to Facebook Live. We still put up archives of the podcast over on our SoundCloud. Everything is Women in Hoodies, SoundCloud.com backslash Women in Hoodies, Facebook.com backslash Women in Hoodies. But we're now doing the shows live, so you can catch us live on Facebook every Sunday starting at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time. And that's it. That is all I've got for you in regards to announcements this week. I hope everybody's having a great week. And let's jump right into the interview with Jay, and I will talk to you all next month. All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of the Woo Woo Hour podcast. I am super excited for our guest this evening, uh, and I'm going to let Jay introduce himself. I, I like that. I like that I don't have to read a whole big bio and, and potentially mispronounce something, as I am prone to do. Um, so I'm going to let Jay slide in here and introduce himself and his work. And then, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a really great discussion about communities and walking um, and redefining those communities and what we can do to kind of build great, sustainable neighborhoods. So, Jay, first of all, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, and sure, please, absolutely. Yeah, and please let everybody know who you are. Okay, yeah, there's an interesting question to be asked uh, who you are. Um, <laughs> I, I always like to <laughs> – I do quite a bit of speaking around the country, and I always kind of like to lower the bar when I come out and I say, <laughs> I just let you know I, I'm an I'm expert on absolutely nothing. I'm a journalist. So I'm just a person that really, you know, my my gifts are essentially curiosity, and and thinking that the you know the best ideas in the world come across in stories. So mm. I was uh, editor for many many years of a magazine called the Etney Reader, um, which some people remember and some people don't. But it was uh, basically an alternative readers digest where we read new 2,000 publications looking kind of for the best freshest solution oriented ideas, and then we published them every two months. And, and from there, I've gone on to just, um, you know, a writer, a speaker, and a kind of a consultant on building strong communities. I've written a couple of books, called one called The Great Neighborhood Book, 
uh, and one called All That We Share, A Field Guide to the Commons. And and more, most recently, I did one called America's Walking Renaissance. Um, so I just, you know, really a lot of what I do is I get to travel quite a bit, which I love to do. And I just mm-hmm. love to go to towns and cities all over the world and, you know, throughout North America. Just I like to sort of walk around and see what's exciting about them and see sort of what could be improved. And, and uh, that's a big part of what I do. And then I sort of write and speak and, and uh, consult about that. That's fantastic. So let's let's kind of let's start at the beginning. How did you get into this? What did you you know? Because you've got a background in journalism. So at what point did you decide yeah. that that's what you were going to do with it? Well, you know, I wanted to write fiction, but the mi- the minute that I wrote a story one day and then saw it in print the next day, kind of turned me into a journalist. I thought, you know, more immediate <laughs> results. <laughs> <laughs> that's and true. That's true. Anyway, and so I. Um, you know, I have always, as long as I can remember, had just a curiosity just about traveling, going places, and looking around places, and not always just sort of the sights that people would see, but I always wanted to kind of, wherever I was, you know, whether it was New York City or, um, you know, some small town in in, uh, in Florida, I just kind of wanted to sort of see what it was like to live in that place. Mm-hmm. And so I think probably, you know, my greatest, you know, my, my, chief, uh, my chief skill is just curiosity. Just you know, and figuring out, you know, what, what kind of what, what makes this place tick, or, you know, there's some problems here. What's, you know, what makes this place, you know, what's keeping this place back? And uh, yeah, and I think, you know, when you read the headlines in the mm-hmm. newspapers and the websites and on cable news and all that kind of stuff, and there's a whole lot of attention devoted to what leaders are doing. You know, political mm-hmm. leaders, and right. business leaders, and Hollywood leaders, and sports figure leaders. And there's actually very little attention paid to just kind of people's ordinary, you know, I don't want to say ordinary people, but people's ordinary everyday lives. And I think that is, you know, the richness and uh, greatness of a culture, I think, comes in just, you know, what, you know, what people experience in their own lives. It isn't how much money people make or how many wars they win or things like that. And so that's always just fascinated me. And it's also fascinated me that, that so many people consider that not at all newsworthy or interesting. I like that you said that because, you know, I've always thought, especially because, you know, I read a lot of Guest Magazine. Um, I've checked out a few of the other sites that you've written for because it's very hard to find that kind of news. And I love it because you, I mean, like you said, it's all this, you know, and nine times out of ten we're hearing about all the horrible things that are happening in the world. But when you kind of dig down into, like, these smaller stories, you find that there's some very interesting um, and very positive changes that are taking place, and you wouldn't even yeah. know it. And it's and it's not. It's kind of. And these aren't like isolated incidents. They're happening, you know, all over. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, yeah. because you're, you're you're going and you're visiting these places. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Also, Yes is a great magazine. I've been a contributing, mm-hmm. you know, kind of on their board of advisors for twenty years, and and they pick up a lot of my stories that I write. And so, yeah. And you know, and, and it's really important because you don't want to just. Um, you know, sort of uh, only dwell on happy news. I mean, you really kind right. of going to say, well, you know, what are the problems and right. not deny those, but then just say, what are the solutions and what are the solutions that are maybe coming from places you, we are not used to looking? You know, I think we, there's a tendency in our culture to sort of think that there's certain places, you know, on the coasts, um, you know, New York and, you know, Silicon Valley and Washington, D.C., that's where the solutions are going to come from. But I think a lot of solutions just come from, really all over the place, and but they don't get the same amount of attention. So I'm just always, you know, one of my rules as a journalist has always been um, that when I look around my, my life mm-hmm. and I see something that's important that isn't really ever talked about in the media, then I kind of think, hmm, that's a good story. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that's awesome. That's a uh, and, and that that shows in in the in the you've got so many I was trying to go through some of them but you've got just so many articles on your website and they were just also interesting. <laughs> so I was kind of combing through. So let me you know, let's and, and, go ahead. Okay. No, please go ahead. Well, oh, um, well, you know, I mean, one thing is I've lived my entire life in the Midwest. Okay. And, and the Midwest tends to be a part of the country that you know, if maybe it's not forgotten, the people it isn't where people are really looking for. Um, you know, the cutting edge, right. <laughs> the latest fashions and things like right, that. Right, And And yet, you know, in my experience, I've met, you know, dazzling people with amazing ideas. And uh, and I think that's true just not in the Midwest, but, but anywhere. 
mm-hmm. you know, and I, and I just think that, you know, when we look to just a small group of people in a few very, you know, concentrated communities around the country and say, these are the people that are going to save us, then we're really in trouble. Right. You know, because I right. kind of think that there's, you know, and that's been, you know, one I of the like communities things. are too diverse for that, entirely too diverse. I mean, exactly, just because the yeah. neighborhoods that I grew up in, I mean, I, you know, I spent some time in New Orleans and now I'm in, you know, Ormond Beach, Florida. And that's it, it's literally like night and day. It's like going to a different country. Yeah, yeah. How different, you know, those two just, you know, just cities are. Never mind the little pockets yeah. of different neighborhoods around here. Um so, yeah, it's never going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. But what I like exactly. about your writing, too, is that especially in um, – I've got it open. Uh, where did it go? Where did it, oh, How to Design Our World for Happiness. You've got oh, – yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a it's, a – it's a great PDF, and it's free, and I highly recommend people. I didn't realize it was yeah, free. Yeah, it's actually – yeah, it's, it's, it is uh, – it's a book that's for free, and you can just uh, basically get a PDF of it on the Internet. It's called How to Design the World for Happiness. So. Everyone you should give. take advantage of that. Absolutely. They really should. And I'll make sure to – I'll link this in the show notes. But you give some great examples of different um, cities that are doing different things. Yeah. Um, and I love that. And I really love how you talked about how let's not ignore the problems or the challenges, but let's not you know just focus on the problems. Let's talk about, well, you know, over here they did this and over here they did that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, New Orleans is one of just my very most favorite places oh, in America. Oh, me too. You know? And I think New Orleans has such a lesson for us right now because, um, you know, it's always been a city that's unclassifiable. You know, mm-hmm. it, 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 you know it, was a, it was a mixing of people from all over the world. You know, and, and jazz, you know, which is one of America's greatest inventions, of course, came straight out of New Orleans. And, you know, it was, it was the, the kind of the, just the musical genius of people from Africa. But actually, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a German community in New Orleans, and they brought the brass instruments. And then you had, you know, the white, you know, southern community there, and they brought, you know, kind of the, the song, the song cycles from, you know, in English folk music. And you had, you know, Native Americans that were there, and just kind of everybody, you know, jazz was just this amalgam coming out of all these cultures. So this, this fear we have now, and we're just, you know, of people, we don't want people in our country that are different. Um, you know, That's we're crazy. making a huge mistake just, because oh, what's yeah. made America the force that it is in the world, you know. And, you know, it can be a force for good and sometimes not a force for good, but, you know. Either way, but, we but learn I something. Think our power and our strength comes from just the fact that we've been a country with a lot of regional differences, a lot of ethnic differences, and just, you know, and that's made all the difference, you know. I mean, that's why the American movie industry took the world by storm from the very beginning, because they had to make movies that would appeal, you know, not just to one ethnic group, but, they, you know, they wanted immigrants and they wanted African Americans, they wanted to sell tickets to everybody. So they discovered kind of a, a universal language of humor and drama and and you know and excitement. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so the more particular movies of say Germany or of Sweden or something like that just couldn't really compete because we were kind of a global country from the beginning. Right. Right, right. Yeah, I don't uh it's interesting watching these different uh kind of uh climate shifts in, in perception and, and how people view yeah. things and it's just uh <laughs> frustrating. Frustrating at times, but you know. Uh, uh I, <laughs> it's going to be okay. I I, 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 I I stay on that. It's it's going we're, yeah, we're gonna yeah. figure this out. We're gonna figure this out. I feel like uh that's literally what we're kind of doing right now. We're just figuring yeah. it out and, and who we wanna be. And I think that's going to be different. Um, cause that's such a, it's almost, it's such a personal question and trying to figure that out at the national level is, uh, no wonder there's so much chaos. No. And is I it, think as we look back on our past, we have to be really careful to be honest about what the past was, mm-hmm. you know, and it, yeah. and it wasn't just simply, right. you know, a country made by and for white people. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> God, what are you, what are you saying, Jay? What is, what is going on? <laughs> I guess that's revisionist history these days. I <laughs> know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to I wanna briefly talk about this article that you wrote for Yes Magazine back in 2013. Um, and okay. it, you titled it, Finding the Gold in Tough Neighborhoods. Um, okay. and, and the first sentence really caught me by surprise because you wrote, the biggest problem in many communities, especially low-income ones, is caused by perception more than reality. Um, mm-hmm. And yes. it's a great article where you kind of talk about how in these 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 neighborhoods, um, you know, the focus is more on that one you know horrible thing that happened and not 
what people are actually doing to kind of yeah. solve their own problems. And I really loved hearing about that. Can you talk on that a little bit, kind of how that's been your experience in a lot of these communities? Yeah, and, you know, it's so interesting because we've seen, you know, in a lot of cities around the country so much change in the neighborhoods over the last 15 years. I mean, places mm -hmm. that people thought would never get back on their feet now are are thriving, you know, and that means why gentrification is not a problem because people live there all along sometimes can't afford to live there anymore. I mean, so, you know, right. but still we, we've had, you know, neighborhoods just kind of, you know, bounce back. And, you know, and it's you know, really interesting to kind of think about how we stigmatize neighborhoods. I mean, you know, a pretty common phrase that probably all of us have used at one time or another was, oh, that's a bad neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, and which yeah. is implying that the people that live there are somehow to blame for what's going on. And there's often you know, a great set of, of causes and factors that, you know, um, have, have made these, these places struggle. So, yeah, it is really interesting. And I, and I, I really believe that, um, you know, that you, you just can't write off anybody or any place. You can't just say, oh, this place is God forsaken. And, you know, and sometimes there are certain people, you know, certain city people will just write off Oh, those suburbs are just, I mean, they're just deadly dull, and, you know, there's not a single original thinker in the whole place, you know, and that's that's every bit as wrong mm -hmm. as saying a poor neighborhood, just everyone's a crook, and and, uh, and no one really wants to work, you know, I mean, right. so just, we can't, these blanket condemnations, I mean, they're easy to do, um, right. you know, and, and America is more, you know, there's sort of less common ground now than I think, you know, at any time since maybe the civil war <laughs> yeah i mean i think yeah. there was more common ground even at, in the most pitched battles of the 1960s than there are today and um you know i think people are farther apart and it's much easier just to sort of uh, um you know you have your compatriots on the web and you have your compatriots um um you know on the t tv channels that you watch you don't really have to ever entertain any idea that isn't just entirely comfortable to your worldview. It's one big echo chamber, unfortunately. Yeah. And I think that some of that, I'm a, I'm a really big believer in, in, you know, celebrating and cherishing local communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I know that, the, I know communities are more like-minded than they once were. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, if you're at a, you know, you're, you know, you're on social media and, you know, reading what, people that think just like you have just put up and then putting up your own stuff, that's way different than going down to the local um, coffee shop or the local tavern or the local bowling alley or the local barber shop or wherever, you know, wherever where people just kind of hang out, you know, where you're going to be running into people that don't agree with you, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and you're going to be face to face with them and, you know, and they may not convince you of anything and you may not convince them of anything, but at least you have sort of a a language to have a civil conversation hopefully absolutely yeah you know and so just i mean meeting people face to face i know you know this is a you know it's springtime and and uh and what that means in a lot of the country is that's when the floods come yeah <laughs> you yeah know, and more and more with climate change um you know and i remember a friend of mine um he lives in iowa city iowa and he was uh and you know and they have the sandbag i'm using kind of a midwestern example here but um yeah, you, you put the sandbags to kind of keep the river from overflowing its banks. And, and he said, I was down there with my neighbor, you know, and we agree on practically nothing except for the fact that we needed to get as many sandbags up as soon as possible. <laughs> so just, you know, and, and it's interesting because there's, there's a lot of uh, just plain disdain and disgust for politics mm -hmm. and for political leaders. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that's sad, actually. Um but, you know, oftentimes people exempt, like, maybe their local mayor or their local city council member. Oh, no, they can, you can trust that guy. And it's because you have a relationship with them. You maybe see them in, in the grocery store. You see them in the park. You see them right. down at, you know, um, you know, the 4th of July, you know, festival downtown where they shoot off the fireworks, so that kind of stuff. I mean, I, so I think just when people aren't face-to-face, -face, and, and that gets me to my favorite subject, which is what my favorite subject is to this point, which is walking. You know, walking is the simplest, most natural act. Um, you know, even people that are paralyzed still walk. They just do it by rolling. Um, you know, and I, we were kind of born as a species to walk, but one of the great virtues for our time is that walking, you have face-to-face -face interaction with people. Mm -hmm. And it's really much harder to keep um, mm -hmm. sort of... 
um, you know, kindling your prejudices about those people if when you're seeing in your them. Face and you're seeing them in and your you're seeing them pushing them. baby strollers, and you're mm-hmm. seeing, you know, and, uh, you know, you slip, you know, you, you slip and fall, and they pick you up, and just things like that that just simply, you know, connects to humanity. I, when, I give, when I give talks around the country, you know, I always I ask a question. I say, well, how many really good friends have you um, made uh, honking at them from behind the windshield and waving? <laughs> <laughs> you know, no one has yet raised their hand to that question. Maybe it's a little bit of a pointed rhetorical question. Um, <laughs> But I think that's really true. When people are in their cars all the time, that, that that kind of opportunity to get to know your neighbors and just to kind of see the world, you know, hey, you're buzzing, you're buzzing by at 40 miles per hour if you don't really see anything. Right. Um, and secondly, you just you miss that chance to connect with people. And I think, you know, I think in the end, uh, you know, all the great virtues of walking are there. But it's just one of the most pleasurable things that a human being can do. If you're in a nice place to walk that feels safe, that feels comfortable, and... Uh, there's other people not walking. It's like, you know, it's like and people are endlessly fascinated by other people. Yeah. Brene Brown said, I don't know if you're familiar with your work, but she's phenomenal. Yeah, no, she she's said, terrific. Oh, I love I her. Like her a lot. Uh, yeah, she says, uh, you know, people are hard, you know, to hate far away, move in. <laughs> you know, you got to yeah. get close. And, and you're right, there is, a, there is a lot of divisiveness, and people, you know, don't always agree. But I, I found that, you know, even the people that I, you know, vehemently disagree with, because it's so easy to disagree on somebody on the Internet, I know them. Yeah. So even though I, you know, we can we can have a list of all the things that me and this person disagree on, I still understand their point of view. I understand where they're coming mm-hmm. from. I understand. And that makes all the difference in the world when you're having these types of conversations, you know. Um, the internet is yeah. wonderful. It's been wonderful for connecting us. It's wonderful for getting information like your articles, like this podcast out. But we lose that um, – a lot yeah. of the conversations I think that we're having right now, especially about who we are and how to do things, we need to be having them face to face. I think mm-hmm. we need to yeah. be having them at a local level because they're just too personal. And it's way just too easy to kind of slip back into our own biases and fear. And that's really hard to do when the person that you're claiming to be afraid of is sitting right across from you. Yeah, you know, exactly. you know that's, that, 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 turns, that makes the conversation completely different. Um, yeah. So let's kind of, you know, segue into how do we design our neighborhoods for this, Jay? Because you've gone around to all these different ones. I mean, even right now, I live in what you would – you gave an example in your article. It's that isolated suburban community where I'm surrounded by houses and pretty yards, but you can't – you know, you got you to gotta drive to get anywhere. There's not yeah, nice yeah. little parks and places and that sort of thing. Um, you know, whereas, you know, in New Orleans, there's all kinds of places where you can just go and communicate with somebody, and I walked all the time, you know. Um, yeah. so kind of how, you know, let's, let's, let's break it down. You know, how can communities kind of start to move in this direction and, and why is it so important? I know it's a big question. Well, I think, you know, um, the two, I, I wrote a book called the great neighborhood book that really kind of addressed mm-hmm. this notion idea of how we just build stronger communities. And the two, I mean, there's many, many ways to do it, mm-hmm. but I think the two that are the most important and in fact they're kind of the most natural and easy too is just simply to get people out walking Mm -hmm. and give people places to hang out together remember when we were all teenagers and it's Mm -hmm. like you know your parents say where'd you go i just went and hung out you know Mm -hmm. that seemed like an evasive answer (laughs) but when you're a teenager that's what you really want to do whether it was the local shopping mall or the local park, or the local main street or something like that you were out of the house all the time all the time you wanted to be where the other people were Yeah. And so I think just anything that brings people together is a positive thing. And that can be, you know, it can really vary from community to community. Um, You know, parks, libraries, schoolyards, um, you know, shopping streets. Those are some of the kind of classic ways where people get together. But I've I've noticed some really interesting around the world. um, you know, San Francisco, which is, you know, one of the most sophisticated cities in America, mm-hmm. um, there was a neighborhood where there was a video store. This, it was a few years ago. Um, and the owner of the video store just built kind of, people kind of hung out on a street corner. So he was a pretty charitable guy. Um, and so he just put a bench out there. Mm-hmm. And that that street corner actually kind of became the, you know, the town square of that community, you know, and just, it was just something as simple as that. And, and, and you're speaking about the kind of suburban neighbors you grew up in. This is a very similar story in a very different neighborhood, but there was a, 
um, I work I work with a group sometimes called Project for Public Spaces. Mm -hmm. They're based in New York, and they've worked in all 50 states and 40 countries around the world just helping people improve the public spaces, you know, the hangouts in people's neighborhoods. And they were doing a, a kind of a community workshop in a place called Mississauga, Ontario. Now, Mississauga is probably the biggest town in North America you've never heard of. It's about 750,000 people. It's a suburb of t Toronto, and, you know, Nice place, except for there's not much to do there. <laughs> oh, wow. And the people realized that, and mm -hmm. they were looking for what, what are some of the things that we can do to make a better community and, you know, to, to have more of these public spaces that everybody wants. And this guy got up, his name was Dave Marcucci, and he said, well, I did something uh, in my front yard. And, and, you know, that got everybody's attention. And uh, he explained that he, uh, he had a fence around his front yard, um, and he took – a part of the fence out, and he built a bench there. <laughs> and you know his neighbors thought he had just completely gone off his rocker. Mm -hmm. You know, well, hey, when you turn down your fence and then you build a bench, who's right, going to right. that bench? You know, but from the minute Dave, you know, hammered the last nail into it, that bench was extremely popular. And it, um, you know, old people were kind of the first people to jump on it, literally almost, because you know they could you know they could take a longer walk because they had somewhere to sit. Right. And the kids all loved it. The kids played on it, jumped up and down on it and stuff like that. And before long, quite a few of these people that had thought Dave has just completely lost his mind by building this bench, they were doing the same thing. You know, and it's funny because I've told that story many times. Mm -hmm. um, and one day my wife and I were, um, I, don't know, I don't know about Florida and where, you know, wherever, wherever the audience is, but we, have, we don't have garage sales because we live in a city. We have yard sales. You know, because the garage is in the back of the lot, so if you just put your stuff out in your yard mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, and sell stuff. And so we were we were walking down the street, and there, there was a park bench. And my wife looked at me, and I looked at my wife, and I said, "Well, I guess we better buy it." <laughs> <laughs> so we lugged this bench home and put it in our front yard. And you know, the Dave Marcucci effect. I mean, just from you know, suddenly, this bench just you know, you put a bench, you know, build it, and they will come. Is the old you know. As the old movie says, you know, this bench is very popular in our neighborhood. You know, and it, it particularly we, we, we're, we live on the corner, so it's where the school buses pick up and drop off kids. So, mm -hmm. you know, in the morning, you know, the kids are playing on it and jumping up and down on it. And in the evening, you know, or in the afternoon, the parents are sitting on the bench waiting for their kids, you know. And sometimes, you know, I'll come up to the house and they'll, someone will say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm saying a bench. I said, no, that's why we put it there. Yeah. I mean, so just yeah. something is simple. You know, I mean, the the best thing, you know, the best way to improve your community is to get together with your neighbors, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and make things happen. Have that conversation. But you know, but this is something you can just do if you don't know your neighbors. Put in put in a bench, and you may get to know them better. Right, 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 right. I like that. I like how simple that is. Like, I mean, that yeah. wouldn't that wouldn't you know, if you ask somebody, you know, how do we rebuild our neighborhood? I mean, um, uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Build a Better Block either, but they're a fun organization. Oh yeah, no, yeah, they're, yeah. They're I watched I watched yeah, no. his TED talk, and you know, he went on and he had a great story about how he improved his neighborhood. Um, but I love that you just put a bench down. I mean, something as yeah. simple as that is just to put a bench. Because I think it's, I mean, especially in you know, we're all about you know our time. Everything is so fast, and we're all so yeah. busy. And then you know. You know, just unplugging and getting out of our homes and going out dinner. It's like it's like we don't do it anymore. We just I don't know what happened, yeah. but at some point we just decided that that wasn't a thing that we do anymore. Um, so it's really yeah, nice. Yeah, no, to, no, it's, it's so interesting. You know, everybody thinks you know, okay, we need to do a strategic thirty-year strategic plan, and we need to mm -hmm. do you know, you know, set goals and write a mission statement, and you know, you know, there's nothing wrong with that stuff, but just simply, just sometimes, just people getting together. Um, you know, I mean, here's what's interesting. I, I've been in a lot of the communities, and I'll say, this place really has something going for it. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll say there was a crisis. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, there was a shooting, or there was a, a, a proposed development that just did not seem to fit with the neighborhood at all, or there was, you know, just there was an empty lot, which no one wanted to develop. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, kind of, dri we tend to be driven more by, you know, what's going wrong than by what's going right. Right. People kind of got together, and then they, um, you know, kind of kept going from there. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so there's a, you know. Things start small, so and then they A crisis kind of can grow. be a great opportunity for, for coalescing a neighborhood. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. You, you also wrote, um, you know, all that we share, how to save the economy, the environment, the internet, democracy, our communities, and everything else that belongs to all of us. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> That's, when, you, like, when you talk about the commons, what, what kind of, let, let's kind of define that and talk about that a little yeah, bit. No, because that, I that's love a really the idea of, uh, of reclaiming these spaces. And especially when you, t- I mean, you walk around on some of these communities, there's like abandoned lots. And there's yeah. all these areas that I feel like people could just claim to do some of these things. So, so let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, the commons, you know, it's, it's funny because it's, it's a word that kind of everybody likes. You know, and and you know, and, and everybody can bring some of their own meaning to it, which is fine. But when I use the word commons, what I really mean is it's those things that really belong to all of us together. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's the literal commons. I mean, there's literally public space that belongs to all of us. You know, which is a park, but a, you know, a sidewalk. But it's also the street. The street is actually, you know, in a lot of communities, streets make up half of the public space in the community right it doesn't feel like a public space it feels like a private property owned by cars <laughs> yeah. um, but in some of the most lively vibrant neighborhoods i ever see the street is actually sort of a shared space i mean right. obviously cars are a you know mm-hmm. are in most you know some there may be some pedestrian streets which i think are a great idea mm-hmm. uh, which we could use a lot more of in our country but you know by and large you know the streets but you know but it is it's not like the bicyclists uh should feel like that they're not allowed there, you know, mm-hmm. or, feel, or feel unsafe there, or just feel uncomfortable there, you know. And and of course, there's that there's those things called intersections, where actually people on foot and people in cars, <laughs> you know, intersect. Right. And right. so we, you know, we need to make those places places where people feel comfortable. And I, you know, there's something that we do a lot of here in Minneapolis. We do it in the summertime, because um, I live up, you know, in, in, in Minnesota. Uh, but they call it an open street. And they'll shut down a street. Usually they'll do it at like Sunday from 9 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon or 4 in the afternoon. Although the, and, and just it becomes a pedestrian street for just a day. And though it is so much fun. And everybody of all ages, all races, all incomes, all political persuasions are out in that street, you know. And, you know, there's music and there's tents and there's, you know, there's serving beer and, you know, and, and uh, you know, there are, Bands are playing and all kinds of stuff like that, but you know, but it's just really such fun. And what happens is, you know, it's supposed to end at four, mm-hmm. but you know, it usually takes the police till about six to actually get people out of the streets because they don't want to give them up. Right, right. Yeah, you know, and and you know, it's funny because the street, through most of human history until the 20th century, streets really functioned like parks, like town squares. Streets are for everybody. You know, it's where. Dogs slept in the streets and kids played in the streets and, um, you know, young people flirted in the streets and old people gossiped. I like to think they flirted, too, uh, (laughs) in the streets, you know. And sure, there would be a chariot or there would be a stagecoach or there would be a streetcar that came through, but it wasn't like people weren't allowed in the streets. And then beginning, you know, beginning in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, depending where you were, the streets suddenly became the, you know, the the sole province of people in cars. Mm -hmm. And we lost a lot there. You yeah. know, because it was, I mean, if, if you ever, I love going to Italy. That is one of my favorite places. And, you know, and they have these things called piazzas there. And, you know, and piazzas really are, you know, one of the world's great inventions for just public space and hanging out. And, and piazzas are really oftentimes it's, it's sometimes just a white spot in the street. You is know, that, and it's still Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask you, and, what exactly is that? Uh, piazza, you know, it would be the Italian word for square. Okay. But but in many times it's not you know it's not a square that we think of as a square because it's just it's, it's sort of like the street the street gets a little wider. They also have piazzettas, which are even smaller piazzas. But you no, know, piazza is just simply a gathering spot. Um, and uh, you know, and I think there's a lot you know, and, and it's not you know the all throughout Latin America they have zocalos and plazas. Mm-hmm. Those are the places where everybody hangs out. And mm-hmm. in the Middle East it's it's souks, you know, and cosbahs, you know, which are basic kind of market spaces that are in the streets. And so, you know, I mean, it's a sort of a reclaiming of the streets that we could all do, you know. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you know, some pedestrian streets, but just, you know, some streets that are more, um, you know, the traffic. Um, Can be tweaked a little. The people in cars just learn to share that space with other people. It's not, yeah. you know, not thinking like, yeah, hey, where, where did that bicycle come from? Right, right, right. Kind of get used to the idea. Interesting. Okay. 
So let me ask you now, because uh, you've you've been to so many different kind of communities and and uh, different neighborhoods and cities. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what is kind of the commonality in the ones that you would consider? I don't know, not the most ha not the happiest, but maybe um, uh, the most um, you know. So not sustainable, but you know they're sh you know they're almost like they're doing it right. You know they've they've mm -hmm. had these problems and they've they, you know they're these challenges, but now they've kind of they seem to have figured it out. Well, I would say you know some of the the properties, qualities, you know assets of a really strong neighborhood are um, there's a lot of street lights. I mean you know we've been talking about that a little bit, but just you know the sidewalks and streets themselves are populated with people. Mm -hmm. And so it's not one of the, and, and it's interesting because those are the safest places in the world because, you know, criminals aren't idiots and no one's going to mug you or steal your purse when there's 30 people around. <laughs> right, right. You know, so, but also, you know, um, I think really, um, you know, just really, I'd say neighborhoods that are really alive. That's what I kind of like to use. Mm-hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, there's there's often a lot of different things for people to do. You know, uh, you know, there's there's usually a shopping district and where they can kind of meet. You know, maybe not, you know, maybe not. They can't go down to the corner and buy a trampoline, but you know, most of the right. things you need in most weeks is available there. You mm -hmm. know, your groceries and a hardware store and things like that. But there's more than just places to shop there. There's, uh, you know, there might be a YMCA. There might be a library. There may be like a bookstore that you know mm -hmm. is a place you can buy books, but it's also a place you go here. You know, writers read, and you it's just kind of a you know, they have story hour for the kids and things like that. You know, just a variety of different things to do, not all of which cost money. Mm -hmm. um, I think great neighborhoods, often really alive neighborhoods, have they have a lot of trees. Mm -hmm. You know, they have uh, you know they have green land, they have and green spaces. Uh, Parkland, things like that, um, and I think they just uh, to get more a little bit into the uh, the psychological dimensions. They mm -hmm. have a they have a pride. Maybe even you might even call it a patriotism. You know that their neighborhood is the best neighborhood, and you know, and other people, other neighborhoods may say that as well. But there's just a real pride, and uh, and you know, and and they they have a lot of opportunities to meet one another. You know, not just as activists you know, fighting a battle or, you know, or as, you know, mm -hmm. board members on the neighborhood board. But, you know, they have chances to kind of interact, you know. Just as people. You know, as as fans rooting for the same team in a sporting event. Um, they as just, you know, just people. It's just, you know, we, we kind of all, in our lives, we all assume a lot of different roles, you know, mm -hmm. in the course of a week or a month. And, and so if people can meet in those different roles. You know, one day maybe... Um, you know, you're playing ice hockey. I keep using these northern references, sorry. Uh, no, it's fine. Playing ice hockey with somebody, and the next day, you know, you're both walking your kid into the school or something. So so kind of you get to be more than just, you know, you're, you're not just that guy that wears a suit to work, or you're not just that kid with a nose ring, but, you know, you, you're kind of known more for who you are, you know, the totality of who you are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that. I like it. It seems like such easy things to do if you can just maybe just get some people together and just get it started and just start small and kind of watch how yeah, it, how it seems to snowball. Yeah, I think it's unnatural to us. It's right. Kind of how, you know, it, it, I think it's instructive, actually, to, uh, um, <laughs> to watch TV programs sometimes because on TV programs, you know, no one ever like, oh, I'm going to come over at 4. I mean, everyone just kind of knocks on the door and they come in, you know, <laughs> and, you know, everybody, you know, ha you know hangs out at the same, you know, coffee shop or bar or something like that. I mean, that's right. what we want in our lives. It's pretty clear. Yeah. We want a sense of connection with the people we live among, you know. Absolutely. Not that we necessarily want to share a bathroom with them. Right, um, right, right. You know, because, you know, some privacy is good, too. But just simply, I think people just want to be more connected than we are. Um, and, and, and I think just that's sort of, in the end, what makes people happy. Yeah, I would agree with that. 100% agree with that. Because, I mean, we feel like we're, we're definitely, like, clamoring for that connection on our Facebook pages and our Twitter pages yeah. and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah. I think if we can you know, kind funny, of – go ahead. Oh, oh, no. We were talking about the commons a minute ago. You yes. Know, and, and I think I, I kind of got um, – Kind of got off on talking about all the physical commons, but you know the internet is a commons. It's something that Absolutely. really belongs to all of us. You know, and, and uh, you know your local library and nonprofit organizations, and 
you, you know, what's interesting, uh, you know, some of the best commons in many communities actually aren't commons, but they function like commons, which mm-hmm. would be, mm-hmm. that would be the coffee shop. Right. That would be the tavern, you know. And, and you know, I, I think successful coffee shop owners and tavern owners um, understand something. is that, you know, they're, they make their money from selling beer or selling coffee or selling, you know, mm-hmm. scones or something like that. But that's not the main reason why people go to those places. The main right. reason they go to those places is to run into their friends. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. For that, you know, yeah, you and, like that kind of and, interaction. And then so, and so they, you know, by providing that commons, by providing that public service, then they're able to kind of make a profit on it. Sure, so, sure, you know, sure. It's a win-win. Is, an, is another great way for people, any kind of market, you know, for people to connect. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and that there's been just a giant I love farmers markets. Farmers they're farmers great. Markets around the country and uh you know and uh there, there, this, there was a big academic study done that said that people have 10 times as many conversations at a farmer's market than in a supermarket <laughs> that's you know? not surprising though because i mean because yeah. i've been to farmer's markets i used to go a lot less as i'm down in florida but i used to do a lot while i was in new orleans um and there's just it's a different it's a different vibe when you know when you yeah. go there, you're more likely to have the conversation with the person that you're buying something from. It's kind of a yeah. there's more of a slow down. Like when you're in the grocery store, you know you're rushing to get that thing done and you're annoyed because everybody's there yeah. and you just yeah. want to get in, kind of get out. You know, but you know at a market, you know, there's there's a there's a personal level that you get. It, it's just it's just different. It's different in a, yeah. in, in a yeah. nice way. You're less purposeful at a market. I think sometimes. Yes. Uh, I think I think Americans, you know, well, I'm not just Americans. I think kind of in the modern world, I think we're addicted to, that everything we do should be purposeful. Everything we should do should have, you know, some kind of accomplishment and outcome. And you know, and the best stuff in life, oftentimes doesn't have any real point to it other than it's just something we really love to do and Absolutely. often do with other people. Absolutely. I, I feel like we would be remiss in talking about the commons in these neighborhoods to not to sort of talk about um, the quote unquote sharing revolution. And you wrote an article ba- yeah. about that back in, you know, 2014. How has that grown when we've talked about that? Because I know that I, I feel like, you know, in the stuff that I've read, you've, you've got to dig for it, but it's out there. You know, co-ops are becoming more popular. Um, yeah, you know, that, yeah. you know, that locally owned thing, people are kind of taking control of their local economies yeah. and that sort of thing. So is that a trend that you've seen continue? And let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, it's interesting because um, the trend, yeah, the trend is certainly continuing. I mean, I think it's gotten a little bit consolidated into Uber and Lyft and mm-hmm. Airbnb and those kind of places, which are, you know, for-profit businesses. Um, there's nothing wrong. And I, 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 I take Lyfts and I stay at Airbnb. There's nothing kind of wrong with that. But, I mean, I think it's it's become a little bit um, – more of a business and less of kind of a sharing operation. So I'm really hoping that, that you know, sharing kind of still continues on the grassroots level. Okay. Um, but, it, you know, really, um, you know, almost every town that I go to these days has a bike share system. Oh, wow. You know, and that's a, you know, and it's a system, you know, sometimes it's government run, sometimes it's, you know, a nonprofit group or something like that. But you can just hop on a bike. And then, you know, and then ride around and then leave the bike at another bike station. And now they actually have some that you you just can um, get the ability to use the bike just by, you know, through your cell phone, just things like that. So, I mean, that's just great to have bikes that are there to share on the streets with people. Mm-hmm. Um, Little things and, like so that. So that's exciting. And, um, you know, and just, you know, by nature, I think human beings are people that by and large like to share. I mean, yeah, we Absolutely. like our own stuff, too. We're wired for it. We really are. Yeah. And I think that's some of the reason um, why the Internet completely, you know, changed the world because the Internet's really a, a great form for sharing stuff, sharing ideas, you know, for teenagers sharing photographs they shouldn't be sharing, you know, on and on and on. <laughs> but we right, kind of right. naturally want to share. Um, yeah. You know, I think, I think it kind of unleashed this, you know, and I think the sharing revolution is, you know, is, is sort of a natural outgrowth of that. Um, but you know, but it is in you know if all the you know, all the profits of that you know kind of just flow into a couple big companies' coffers, then then the sharing revolution, I think you know there's a missed opportunity quality quality to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So in the last little bit here, I definitely want to talk about your most recent book because um, you, you've okay. written a, a ton of articles about it. And it's called America's Walking Renaissance, How Cities, Suburbs, yeah. and Towns Are Getting Back on Their Feet. I mean, I used to walk all the time. I used to walk 30 blocks a day when I was in New Orleans. It was great. You don't even notice it. It was 15 blocks to work and 15 blocks back, and it was yeah, fantastic. Yeah. I loved it. Um, and you just feel good doing it. So, and uh, you wrote you wrote this book with uh, two other people, and I and you've given some examples too. Uh, you wrote an article as well about what America's most walkable suburb can teach towns everywhere. Uh, let's talk about yeah. that because uh, you know we do. We've got to get you know out from behind this computer and get back yeah, on our feet. Yeah. Well, and I think you know it's interesting. When people say, "Well, why should I walk?" Well, you know, walking is, and you know, doctors and healthcare organizations. You know, walking, and even Time Magazine on a cover story, you know, walking is sort of a miracle drug. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you know, people in the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta um, recommend that people engage in brisk physical activity, and, you know, the easiest brisk physical activity is walking, 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, your likelihood of coming down with any number of, you know, quite uh, you know, everything from depression and dementia and diabetes to um, various forms of cancer and heart disease and osteoporosis, you know, is reduced by about 40%. I mean, so there's really, it has remarkable health benefits. And you think, God, you know, 30 minutes a day, that's a lot. But, you know, if you, uh, let's just say you take the bus to work mm -hmm. and your bus stop is seven and a half minutes from your front door and your, the, your workplace is seven and a half minutes from your bus stop, from the bus stop at the other end, Bam, you got your 30 minutes a day every day there. So it isn't necessarily, oh, now i got to walk for 30 minutes. But it's just simply you can, you know, if you can walk to the grocery store, if you can walk to, you know, walk your kids to school, walk over to your friend's house, mm -hmm. you know, walk to your church or synagogue or temple, you know, on and on and on. You know, that walking can just, if you can make it a natural part of your life. You just, you know, you'll feel better, you'll look better, you'll lose weight, and you'll be healthier. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's not just me saying that, you know, right. that that's, that's coming from the Centers for Disease Control. Right, 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 right. And so, yeah, but, and, you know, and so, um, and again, people kind of think, oh, that's something that people do in cities, walking. But, you know, um, but that's not necessarily true at all. And that's, in this book, I wanted, I took a particular effort to look at places around the country that were, you know, making strides, so to speak, uh, about walking. And I included suburban areas. I included small towns. Um, you know, some really inspiring stories. There's a, I live in Minnesota, and there's a town, a small town called Albert Lee. And Albert Lee was a meatpacking town, which is kind of like a steel town, only, you know, with a slaughterhouse instead of a uh, foundry. Mm -hmm. And the steel, the, the, excuse me, the meatpacking plant closed, and still, you know, so that really the reason for Albert Lee to be there was gone. And, you know, and this city began to see some kind of declines, and people got together and decided, um, you know, they invited in um, some people to kind of help make the city more walkable, to make it more healthy. Mm -hmm. And that's had a tremendously great effect. They've really, the downtown has blossomed again, and they've actually narrowed some of their streets downtown and put out sidewalk cafes on some of the expanded sidewalk cafes. And this is, you know, this is not a fashionable, you know, it's not a college town, it's not a resort town, it's not a wealthy town. It's just a, a you know, typical everyday American you know, city of 18,000 people. And they're seeing a real renaissance coming from just that kind of commitment to being making an easier place to bike, an easier place to walk, an easier place to eat healthy food. Wow. You know, so, and... and I and again, love the not, little things. I love how they just change so much. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, and, and uh, so that's just kind of one example. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a town called Baldwin Park, California. It's a largely Latin Latino community mm -hmm. um it's a suburb of los angeles you know that's where kind of the whole you know um automo american automotive culture automotive culture began and people in this community just kind of realized boy there was a lot of obesity it had the highest obesity rates for young people of any city in california um and that really scared them mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know so they've just pulled together and you know held bunch of meetings at the schools, you know, held both in Spanish and English, and they came up with all kinds of plans to get people walking more, particularly getting kids to walk to school more. There's a lot of social movements going on right now. There's something called Safe Routes to Schools, which is just simply, you know, in 1970, 1969, I think um, 
over 70% of all kids living within one mile of their school walked oh, or wow. biked. So that number is now at 15%. And the good news is it hit rock bottom. It was actually 13%, so it's going up now. Yeah. And some of that is because communities all over the country are creating self safe routes to school Ooh. programs, which are just looking at, you know, what can you do to make it easier for kids, easier and safer, mm-hmm. to make it for kids to walk to school? You know, and sometimes it's just finding safe routes. <coughs> sometimes it's putting in, you know, having crossing guards mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. putting in, you know, better, you know, putting in some some um, infrastructure on the streets so dr- motorists don't drive so fast. Right. So they obey the speed limit, obey the law. Um, you know, and, and just, you know, it's sometimes just kind of programmed to motivate the kids to do it. Um, there's something called a walking school bus, which is a, a brilliant idea. It's just I like a school bus, this. but without the school bus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, someone serves as the driver uh-huh. and walks from house to house to house and picks up kids uh-huh. and takes them to school. Now, some people say, well, you know, that'd be great, except for my kid lives, you know, 11 miles from the school. <laughs> well, they do walking school buses where the school buses will drop the kids off at a park or a mm-hmm. um, or somewhere, you know, about a 15-minute walk from the school. So they'll get a walk the last 15 minutes of school. You know, and oh, I that's got to help, My too. father was an educator for 30, 40 years. And, uh, you know, the teachers know which kids walk to school and which kids didn't. Because I Because the bet. kids that walk their bike to school often are ready to learn, and the other ones are kind of twitchy, and, and right. <laughs> they have to burn off some energy before they really can get down to, the you know, their ma- doing their math. Right, right. Oh, what a great so idea. America's Walking Renaissance, again, is absolutely free. Uh, if you just Google America's Walking Renaissance, mm-hmm. you'll get to a, a, a website, and you can just download a free PDF of that, too. Yeah. I'll make sure that I put a link in the show notes as well so people can grab yeah. it. Absolutely. Yeah, so both those so in, in the spirit of the commons, both those books are available to anyone that just, you know, can get on the computer and, you know, uh, how to design our world for happiness and America's Walking Renaissance. Both free. Both are free PDFs, guys. Highly, yeah. highly recommend that you go and pick them yeah. up. Jay, thank and you. And if people so would like oh, uh, to you know, engage with me further or mm-hmm. you know, invite me to your community. Just about to a, tell you that. Go for it. Talk, <laughs> you can go to my, my website, which is uh, www, of course, J-A-Y-W-A-L-L-J-A-S-P-E-R.com. That's it. That's his website. That's how you connect with him, guys. I highly recommend it. Go and check out Jay's books. Uh, check out his work. He he writes for you. Write you still write for for several different publications too. So it's uh, yeah. I write you know I write for yeah. I have kind of a little kind of a news syndicate where I'll send it to Yes Magazine and I'll send it to various other kind of websites around mm-hmm. the country, Huffington Post. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, Mother Earth News runs mm-hmm. a lot of my articles. Yeah. Um, the magazine I used to work for, uh, any reader. Thankfully, runs <laughs> runs my articles and just and other kind of different funny little websites. Um, you know, I, I hardly ever write about gardening, but gardening websites all over the country seem to pick up my stories because hey, I think people spaces. who garden are also people who like mm-hmm. to walk and people who like to bike and people who like to have, you know, strong neighborhoods. So absolutely, absolutely. Do you have anything uh, upcoming that you want to plug? Um, not really. No. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> Um, I'm, work, I'm, you know, kind of got a couple book projects that aren't really too ready to be, you know, discussed yet. So I'm just, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, know kind of uh, just plugging away, you know, at things. And, and uh, but I really do. I love to come just to communities and help people think about how to, how to kind of activate those communities and make them a better place for everyone who lives there. Perfect. Perfect. So if you are a local community and you'd like to get in touch with Jay, I will again make sure that his information is in the show notes so you can absolutely do that. Jay, thank you so much for oh, taking time Oh, thank you. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's been a great time. Uh, guys, we will see you again on the Woo Woo Owl podcast next month, and I'm going to try to double it up next month, see if I can't uh, spoil you guys a little bit, and we'll have two guests on for April, but we'll see how that goes. In the meantime, do check out Jay's books, check out his website, check out his writings, uh, and start the conversation in your own neighborhoods. Do not be yeah. shy, and just start yeah. small. That's what we've been talking yeah, you'll about. You'll find a lot of my week. articles are on my website, too. Yes, so they are. Yeah, he makes it he makes it real easy to uh, to uh, get the information, so that's perfect, because I know everybody He's so busy. Slow okay. down. Well, thank you for doing this podcast. I mean, this is you know, this is a great contribution to just sort of uh, you know restoring, restoring the you know restoring the our our nation and uh, you know 
getting us on the path that we need to be on. Hopefully. Hopefully. Just got to do my part. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks for listening to the Woo Hour podcast. This podcast airs monthly over on the website, in the mind of crystalstorm.com. You can support this work and other creative content by visiting our Patreon page, patreon.com backslash mind of a creator. We'll talk to you next month. <laughs>